Hello, everyone, and welcome to Forage Focus 2022. My name is Terry Noon, and I am the chair of the Ontario Forage Council. This is the second of three webinars for this year's virtual conference. Thank you to the Dairy Farmers of Ontario, Kemen, Berenberg USA, SGS Canada, and GoForages.ca for their generous partnership of this year's webinar series. Today's webinar is brought to you by Minto Ag Limited and Silo King Forage Treatment. Today's session is called Connecting the Dots, Fiber Digestibility, Animal Performance, and Feeding Behavior. Our presenter is Dr. Luiz Ferreredo. Luiz is originally from Brazil, where he, where he earned his Bachelor of Science in Animal Science from Sao Paulo State University in 2008. Immediately after the completion of his Bachelor of Science degree, Louise joined University of Wisconsin-Madison for an internship, 2009, followed by a Master of Science in 2011 and a PhD in 2015 in dairy science with a focus on applied dairy nutrition and forage quality. After the completion of his PhD, Louise joined the William H. Minor Agricultural Research Institute as a postdoctoral research associate. From 2016 to 2020, he worked as an assistant professor of livestock nutrition at the University of Florida. Currently, Louise is an assistant professor and ruminant nutrition extension specialist in the Department of Animal and Dairy Science, Sciences at University of Wisconsin-Madison, and his research interests are applied dairy cattle nutrition and management with emphasis on starch and fiber utilization by dairy cows, corn silage, and high moisture corn quality and digestibility, the use of alternative byproducts as feed ingredients and supplementation of feed additives to lactating cows. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Louise. Thank you, Terry, for the introduction and thanks for the opportunity uh, to share some of our uh, research with you today. Our goal will be to connect the dots between fiber digestibility, animal performance, and feeding behavior. And in order to do that, we'll review the effects of forage quality and nutritional management on performance and feeding behavior, and discuss the potential effects on feeding behavior and lactation performance. So if you think about forage quality, I think the key method trick that we have to use is fiber, right? So if you think about the dairy cow consuming about 60 pounds of dry matter uh, per day uh, in a diet containing approximately 30% NDF, th that means that this cow will be consuming about 18 pounds of NDF, right? And if you go through literature data, and make some calculations related to that, it would be expected that rumen digestion of NDF for this specific cow would be about eight pounds. But the problem is there's a lot of variation, a lot of factors that affect fiber digestibility. So in reality, these cows may be uh, digesting 11 and a half pounds or as low as four and a half, right? And I think that's very important because in theory, for each pound of digestible fiber, we could expect about three pounds of milk, uh, of extra milk, right? So obviously this is crucial uh, for animal performance and it has to be taken into consideration. Said that, here's just some examples of a fiber quality summary for corn silage in the United States. And the way we are presenting that is we have specific parameters that I will discuss one by one here, uh, followed by a column where we indicate how to improve quality. Okay, so basically if the arrow is pointing down, it means that we want a little bit less, right? The only exception here that we have to be careful will be MDF, right? We want to have fiber in forages, obviously, right? But for the other parameters, if the arrow is pointing down, it means that we want to reduce that number if it's pointing up, it means that we want to increase the number to the extent we could, right? After that, we have the number of samples that was used for this exercise and then the normal range. Okay, the normal range basically is the average of all those samples plus minus one standard deviation, 
Okay, so it does not cover everything that we see in terms of those numbers, but what is the most common, right? So basically, if we think about that, uh, lignin and UNDF, which is the undigested NDF after 240 hours of incubation in human fluid, are two assays that help us to understand the indigestible portion of fiber, right? So basically, lignin is the indigestible portion of fiber, but it crosslinks with cellulose and hemicellulose, which is uh, the digestible portion that the dairy cow can digest and utilize, and the UNDF accounts for ligating and some of the cross links with those other fractions that cannot be digested, right? So our goal with management practice uh, related to forage production or hybrid selection is always to try to reduce those numbers to make sure that you increase the digestible portion of the forage, right? Uh, the NDFD30 is basically an in vitro or an in situ assay that will be run for 30 hours. It's very traditional for most commercial laboratories. And then the TTMDFD is a commercial assay for a specific laboratory. It was actually developed here at the University of Wisconsin and accounts for multiple time points and then UNDF in order to predict digestibility by a dairy cow. Right? So the normal range for each of those is presented here, but why do we care about those numbers, right? Why, why do cows care about those numbers? So if you think about that, uh, those different fiber quality indicators, uh, they have potential to cause intake limitation because of room and fill. Basically, if you have a lot of legging in a forge or a lot of UNDF, you're going to increase the content of these nutrients in the diet. And because of that, it's going to take longer for that forage to be reshoe, masticated, digested, and passed through the room into the uh, gastrointestinal tract or the hind gut. And because of that, the forage will be pretty much stuck in the rumen of a dairy cow. And at a certain point, this will uh, preclude the animals to consume more, right? And this is particularly important because not only limitation of intake impacts milk yield, but also impacts the establishment of high forage diets. I think we live in, a, in an era where more and more we will have to rely on high forage diets because of feed prices, right? Feed prices are very expensive for a while now, and you know, it probably will continue to be, right? Uh, also, there is a lot of discussion about uh, dairy cows consuming feeds that could go for human consumption. So more and more we'll have to rely on. Uh, byproducts, right, as well as forages, which humans cannot consume and digest, but dairy cows can, right? So they are doing a service for us, a very good service, very important service, right? So because of that, we have to really consider fiber digestibility. Just to give you an example of that, right, and this is work from about 30 years ago, but still very relevant. Uh, researchers from Michigan State uh, they show us that for every one percentage unit of increase in NDF digestibility for those in situ or in vitro assays that we mentioned earlier, have potential to improve intake by 0.4 pounds, which is about 0.25 kilograms, okay, and consequently fat corrected milk by 0.55, right, which is about 0.32 uh, kilograms per day, okay. If you go through diets that are heavy in corn silage, you can see that the result is not too different, right? So basically, by having a more digestible or fiber digestible diet, you would allow dairy cows to consume more and consequently produce more, right? And this is very important because, uh, especially for high producing cows, which requires a lot of of energy, but their rumen are not getting bigger, right? We don't change rumen size with genetics, right? And I hope we don't, because I, I don't think it would be an easy thing to do, but I think it's very important that we see the limitation uh, moving forward, right? But fiber digestibility is actually much more than intake. So some years ago, I had opportunity to work with Dr. Grant in a review manuscript and when we were working uh, in this specific manuscript, we decided to summarize a comparison of some of his studies where he compared cows fed corn silage and cows fed sorghum silage. Okay? The goal today is not to discuss corn and sorghum silage, but instead of uh, would be to 
use corn silage as a proxy for a more digestible diet and sorghum silage as a proxy for a less digestible diet. So the way we are presenting data here is uh, the percentage that the sorghum silage based diets or less digestible diets, right? The cows consuming the diet perform related to the cows consuming the more digestible diet. For example, if we use the first study here, the GRANT94, and we go to intake, basically the cows consuming the less digestible diet only consume 88% of what the cows consuming the more digestible diet is, did, right? So basically, and as expected based on the previous slide, right? You can see that if they're consuming less digestible diets, their intake will be between 85 and 95% of what it could be if they were consuming more digestible diet. But you knew that, right? We know that for so many years. What was surprising and very interesting to us is that those cows not only consume less amount of feed, but they take between five and 20% more time at the feed bunk to do that. So if you were thinking about that, what those cows could be doing, right? Uh, we don't know, right? We don't have a specific uh, trial design to answer that question, but we know that these cows could be sorting, right? For a more digestible portion of the diet. They could be masticating for longer. We know that coarser particles and less digestible forages takes longer to be masticated and swallowed by dairy cows. Because at the end of the day, the cows will reduce the bolus or the material that she will be ingesting to a same particle size and takes a little bit longer, right? So because of that, I think it's important to realize that if they eat less and spend more time, very likely they also spending less time resting, right? And perhaps that's part of the reason why we see lower milk production. Said that, we have to also understand that the forage and feed quality is a small but very important aspect of the system, right? And when we think about cows utilizing the diet, there are a lot of factors to consider, okay? Obviously, we do not have time to discuss that today in, in depth for all of those factors, but I think it's important to realize that the combination of all those different factors is what makes cows perform, right? Said that some years ago, we ran a study trying to understand the importance of rumination. Okay, and I know you're not seeing rumination written anywhere in this slide, but that's how this project started. Okay, uh, basically, we wanted to understand the relationship between diets and rumination, but we collected a lot of data about eating time. So when we realized what happened in that study that I just mentioned to you between sorghum versus corn silage. I went back and said, okay, usually rumination trials, they are conducted when we change the diet with either more or less forages, uh, more or less digestible forages, changes in particle size. So very often is related to the NDF or the forage portion of the diet, right? So what does that tell us in terms of eating time? And it was very surprising to see that it actually matches uh, a lot of what we saw uh, for the observation about corn and sorghum silage, right? So basically what we saw is for every minute that that cow spends more in the feed bunk, very likely she will eat less and she will produce less, right? It's important to remember that behavior like eating time is related to many factors, but in this case, it was affected by the diet, okay? Not by the animal, not by the management, right? Those may have different effects, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. This is only the effect of the diet related to forages. And I think it's key because tell us that if you add a lot of forages, right? Or if by any chance uh, that forage is not digestible or those have very coarse particles, you will be limiting intake, increasing the time that cow spends at the feed bunk and very likely reducing performance. Here's just an example about that. And you can see that as we increase forage NDF, the eating time increases, right? And I think that's important because usually when we increase forages, we are reducing some of the concentrate, including byproducts that are often very digestible, right? So because of that, you see that increase. Okay, by no means I'm telling you to don't increase forages. 
in the diet, I think is key, crucial uh, for dairy profitability. But we have to remember that we also have to improve the quality of the forage. So because of those results, uh, we designed a study where we wanted to understand a little bit more about that. Okay, and that's the time of the presentation where I disappoint you, okay, because I'm going to tell you what we tested, and then I'm going to show you other things because we didn't find anything, okay. So basically what we had here was a study where we wanted to understand the interactions between digestible or undigestible NDF, lactation performance and behavior. And the way we did that is, you can see the pictures here, uh, that's our dairy research farm in Arlington, Wisconsin. And the picture on the right shows some of those blue feeders, uh, which is the Eisentag feeders. And basically those feeders, uh, we allow specific cows to consume from them. And then it records every time a cow enters the gate and every amount she consumes. So we can calculate any sort of feeding behavior. Okay, so because of that, we have a lot of retrospective data that we could work with and try to understand, okay, what's the variation in UNDF and or digestibility of fiber and how those, how, how cow interacts with that, right? Well, we got five unpublished trials, okay, about 300 cows. They were all very similar in design, stay for at least six weeks in the pen consuming the diet. Everything was collected identically, and the diet was very similar, and that's why I'm going to disappoint you. I don't have enough variation to discuss the fiber here, but we learned a couple other things with that study that I think it's important to think about it, right? So one of the things that we saw is, and, and just before I describe this specific table, for all those five trials, cows were not restricted to a feed bunk. Okay, they could eat from anywhere because it was exactly the same diet. Okay, so we could measure a couple of things. Usually we cannot when running other types of research where we have a specific diets. Okay? But what we saw was for each bunk visit or every time a cow entered one of those blue feeders to eat, right? The more she does that, less she eats. And this is counterintuitive. Right, because you would assume that the more the cows goes to the feed bunk, more she is gonna eat, right? And that's expected, right? But in reality, if that cow is looking for a place to eat for very long, it looks like it's not beneficial, right? Clearly, she has an issue with intake and performance because of looking for a place to eat very likely, right? In addition to that, you can see that bunk visit is related to eating time, okay? And reduces eating rate. Eating rate is how much is gonna eat per minute, okay? And I think that's very important because it shows us that if a cow is looking for a spot to eat for too long, she's very likely sorting, trying to figure out what is there and then not consuming. Okay, so I think that was one of the nice things that we learned with that study, even though it was not our initial uh, goal with that. But why does that matter? right? Uh, if you think about a dairy farm that obviously is not going to have those gate feeders, right? Why does that matter? So let's think about TMR consistency for a minute, right? So let's use your dairy as an example here, right? So here's a simple evaluation of TMR consistency using particle size as a metric, right? So basically you have in blue the top sieve of the Penn State shaker box, in pink the the eight millimeter sieve, and then in yellow, everything else, right? Samples one to 10 are samples across the feed bunk, 11 is the average, right? Well, you can see that your mixing and delivery of the diet is very consistent, right? So under those circumstances, and theoretically, we wouldn't expect cows to be sorting a lot or looking for a spot to eat, right? But in contrast, let's think about your neighbor here, right? So that's your neighbor, right? And basically you can see that there is a lot of variation across the feed bunk, right? Well, do you think that the cow prefers to eat where, right? Which part of the diet you think she wants to consume? And then we don't know, right? So basically the, the cows that are going to spot number one 
are definitely not consuming the same diet the cows are on spot five or nine or 10, right? So there is a lot of variation there. That's why that's so important, right? Because very likely under these conditions, cows will be looking for a place to eat more often than your dairy, right? Farm number one in this example, right? Said that, uh, this is a study out of Canada. Okay, so basically in this particular study, researchers went to 22 dairies over seven consecutive days uh, during the summer and winter periods. And then they collected and measured particle size and they analyzed coefficient of variation, which is a good metric to understand uh, issues associated with that, okay? So basically, uh, if we go back one step and think, what does that mean in terms of laboratory settings? Okay, here in my laboratory, whenever we run an assay, uh, our goal is to have 5% coefficient of variation, not more than that. If this number is higher than five, we run again, right? Obviously, there are some assays that we have to use a 10% metric because of the difficulties of the assay, but just to give you a perspective on that. Right? So as you can see, for the 19 millimeter sieve or long particles, there's a lot of variation, right? What does that mean is very likely there is a lack of consistency on how diets are offered, okay? And the only reason I'm showing this study is because we don't have a study specific like this for US. I guarantee you that if we do the same thing here in Wisconsin, that's how it would be, okay? That's the same everywhere, okay? Same in Brazil as well, right? But I think a couple of things that researchers learned with this exercise was less variability was associated with greater intake and greater milk production. In addition to that, uh, and together with a lot of other measurements that they performed, they saw that more variability existed from formulated to offer diets than day-to-day -day variation. Okay, so there are both types of variability that has to be considered there. Okay, so probably errors while mixing the diet. And remember, dairy cows like consistency. So going back to all this discussion, right, on how we started with this, very likely cows have a preferred spot, right? So this is a study conducted with heifers that actually show that and also show that inconsistent diets and inconsistent could be errors in mixing, could be errors... Uh, in the amount of each ingredient and so on, increase the change in eating spot by 51%, right? And obviously, inconsistent diets cause three and a half more times cows to displace other cows from the feed bulb. And I think that's important because it shows how your nutritional management may be drastically changing the way cows consume and consequently perform, right? Uh, said that, right, the same study I just mentioned to you that we conducted here, we try to understand that using some data from those blue feeders. Uh, and basically, this graph here is very hard to navigate because it looks like cows eat all the same, okay? So basically, here what we have is we have where did those cows eat throughout those six weeks? This is a group of cows from one specific study only, okay? Colors are different beans or different gates. And basically you can see that overall cows eat across the entire pen, right? But if I clean this data by plotting only the largest meal of each cow per day, we start seeing patterns, right? Not all cows have patterns. Uh, if I had to guess, I would guess that dominant cows eat anywhere they want and they go around the pen. I, I could see you telling me, well, Luis, I don't think that's the case. I think actually the last dominant cows, they eat in more places because she goes where she can, right? I agree with you. We don't really know what's going on here. But if we use uh, an example here, let's use an extreme. And this is a very extreme, okay? The third row, the last cow on the right, 80-75, you can see that the vast majority of her meals or largest meal occur in a very specific part of the pen, right? She's the more obvious one, but you can see the different cows have different patterns. I don't know why she cow, this cow does that, but I know she probably has a very good reason, right? So I guess the take home message from this is 
Cows have to adjust to multiple things. It could be lameness. Maybe this is the cow that does not want to walk too much. Maybe this is the cow that came back from the milking parlor first, and then that's where she laid down. So consequently, she wants to eat near where she laid down, right? But the important thing to remember is if we don't have a consistent, a consistent diet distributed across the feed bunk, very likely the cow that wants to eat in her preferred spot cannot do that. And she will start looking for other spots and consequently eat less and produce less. Another issue associated with management that are very likely related to the diet and could be related to diet digestibility, uh, diet mixing, as well as particle size of the diet is sorting, right? Uh, if you pay close attention to this picture, you obviously saw cows consuming a diet exactly this way. She started eating in circles, opening uh, a hole in their TMR and consume what she wants to consume. That's her natural behavior. And it's very hard to copy with that, right? Uh, that same study uh, is published in a different year because it's a different data set, but it's the same study measure that between offering an infused diet, and you can see that there is a lot of sorting going on in commercial dairies, okay? Again, this is true everywhere, right? It's not specific for those 22 dairies. It's very likely happening in many dairies across the world. So I think the take home message is, if you give cows a chance to sort, they will sort. Because, you know, just think like this, and everybody has a different preference, but if you put salad and steak, for me, I will eat the steak. I guarantee you that, right? Others will eat salad, right? But it's your call there. But the, the cows have their preference on feeds as well. Okay. Said that, management of particle size is very important. And if you think about it, for many years, we discussed about the importance of the 8 millimeter sieve and the 19 millimeter sieve of the Penn State shaker box, for example, right? As such, the new NRC has a lot of uh, recommendations based, that were generated based on data with the 19 millimeter sieve. And, you know, I'm not better than anyone in that committee. I'm not smarter than anyone, but I'm going to tell you that I don't like the 19 millimeter sieve. Okay, and I will explain to you why, okay? So here's just a, an example of that. So it's very obvious that those different sieves bring very different particles. But I had the opportunity to collaborate with a study in Brazil uh, in recent years. And basically what we did for this study is we had a control diet, okay? Which had 17% NDF coming from corn silage. Corn silage was the only fourth source in this diet, okay? Uh, this is the most traditional way of feeding cows in Brazil. That's why we only use corn silage, okay? Then, we had a second bunker where students separated particles uh, using the Penn State particle separator. And they re those in plastic drums, okay? Only particles below eight millimeter, between eight and 19 millimeter, or greater than 19 millimeter. And then those diets, the, those other three diets were formulated exactly the same way, 17% NDF from corn silage, plus 9% NDF from each of those specific fractions, okay? We corrected for starch, obviously, because the uh, fraction with la uh, lower than eight millimeters would have way more starch, right? That, that's where kernels would be. And then we fed cows to try to understand and particle size has any effect or all of those are important. That's what we wanted to learn, okay? I'm not gonna show a lot of data from this study, okay? Just some of it. But you can see that uh, except for control, which has a little bit less fiber because we needed to have a negative control, you can see that UNDF and NDF is very similar, okay, across the other three diets. And same for starch, right? So the diet is very similar. However, if you see NDF above the eight or above the 19 millimeter C, you can see that each of those treatments reach what we needed. Right? So basically you can see that we have a specific distribution here to test for those particles. But now let's go to what it matters, right? So when we go to dry matter intake and milk production, you can see that actually the cows fed the H19 millimeters were the cows that perform best, right? And this is also true for milk fat. 
And I think that's very important because if we go back and we think about the 19 millimeter C, we would expect the same response, right? And in reality, we did not see the same response. If we go a little bit further, uh, we didn't find any differences in, room, in eating time, but rumination was also more pronounced for that specific group consuming particles between eight and 19 millimeter, right? Those animals also sorted less than the cows fed the 19 millimeters. And here's where I wanted to get. Okay. The 19 millimeter C is very effective in terms of effective fiber, right? But those are the particles that the cows can sort. So we have to be careful with those. And because of that, I think that when we formulate diets, if we are based on the 19 millimeter C, we also have to make sure we have a very good sorting measurement to make sure the cows are consuming what we expect them to be consuming. So here is just some uh, recommendations in terms of particle size. Uh, this was adapted from some documents from Dr. Grant plus some of my own opinions, okay? So the way I see that is the 19 millimeter sieve is effective However, they will only be effective, effective if cows consume that because those are the sortable particles, okay? Those particles also may affect silage density. So if you have a lot of coarse particles, you may have to pack for longer, okay? Or with more weight, okay? And we'll very likely increase eating time and reduce eating rate because those cows will be trying to sort and will be taking longer to masticate, okay? The eight millimeter sieve is the true physically effective fiber. Okay. And then for those of you that use the 1.18 or four millimeter C, I believe that those particles may provide some physical effective fiber, but not to the same extent. Let me go back one step, okay? So if we go back here, you see that for the lower than eight millimeters, Okay, in this case, we didn't have the other sieves and it would be too complex for us to implement multiple sieves more than that. But you can see that milk fat's not as high as the eight to 19 millimeter, okay? Same for production and intake. And also you can see that uh, the plasma LPS, which is one of the potential indicators of rumen acidosis, okay? Is much higher. Okay, it's similar to the control. Okay, so you can see here that it definitely does not stimulate the same amount of effective fiber. Okay? And then obviously uh, for harvesting of corn silage, it, the, these two sieves, the 1.18 or four millimeter, may help you to see intact kernels, okay, which we also want to make sure we break during corn silage harvesting. Another important thing to consider is that there are a lot of diet and management interactions that we may not fully understand and that I think we need to learn more about. Uh, here's an example of that. So this is a study conducted by the Miner Institute. And basically what they were trying to learn was under overcrowding conditions, does the diet affect room and pH more or less, depending on that factor. So basically what they did is they had two stocking densities, 100% or 142%, which is not unusual for the US dairy industry. And then they had two diets, one with more undigestible MDF, about 9.7%, and one with less, 8.5%. Okay, so the question was, is there an interaction for room and pH? And what we are showing here today is the pH for the, the time, no, sorry, the time that the cows spend with pH lower than 5.8. Why pH 5.8, okay? That's the threshold for pseudoacute ruminal acidosis, which also leads to milk fat depression and other issues, right? And what you can see is, if you have 142% stocking density and you feed the more digestible diets, your cows are very likely more susceptible 
to have acidosis. This very likely is true if you're feeding very digestible sources of starch and so on. We don't have the data, but very likely this is true. Okay? And I do think this is a very good example on how feeding management or management practice at the herd interacts with the diet, and we have to take that into consideration. Okay? Said that, uh, conclusions for this presentation, for GNDF digestibility, physical characteristics, and forage concentration in the diet, they all affect intake and modulate feeding behavior patterns of dairy cows, okay? For GNDF digestibility, the more digestible it gets, very likely the cows will consume more and will spend less time at the feed bump. So the cows very likely will be able to rest more, okay? And ruminate while laying down, which is also very important, okay? If you have two coarse particles, that cow will very likely spend more time trying to sort or sorting, okay? Will take longer to masticate and swallow the feed and consequently will eat less and very likely produce less. And foraging the diet is a key aspect of their profitability. More and more, we have to consider that but we have to do that together with forging the after digestibility and physical characteristics of the diet to make sure that more forage does not mean lower intake or extra time at the feed bunk uh, and make sure we can continue to produce well, okay? A couple of things that I want to remind you is that animal individual characteristics as well as feeding management also play a major role on feeding behavior and performance, and very likely those interact with diet characteristics and affect the dairy cow, okay? Also, if you pay close attention to certain animal characteristics, maybe the response on feeding behavior consequently to performance are not necessarily the same to what we presented here, because what we presented here today is only related to the diet effect on behavior and consequently performance. Okay. And I also want to highlight that very likely cows have a preferred spot to eat. And this information highlights that adequate nutritional management has to focus on ensuring cows receive and consume their formulated diet. And also that cows do not keep looking for a place to eat because she will eat less and produce less. Uh, with that, I would like to... Thank you again uh, for the opportunity of being here today, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Luis. Um, yeah, we've had a few questions come in to the chat. Um, so first off, right back at the very beginning when you were talking to us about different ways to improve forage quality, one of the metrics was TTNDFD. Can you tell us what TTNDFD stands for, please? Absolutely. So TTNDFD stands for Total Tract NDF Digestibility. In this particular case, it's not measuring the total tract of a dairy cow. It's a prediction based on uh, laboratory assays. This specific assay utilizes 24, 30, and 48 hours in vitro incubation, okay? And UNDF to predict this number. Okay, thank you very much. Um, what was the UNDF of, to of the total ration in the feeding times trial? For this one, right? I believe so, but John, if you could uh, put a note in the chat, are we looking at the right trial? Yeah. I think it is this trial. I do have this data, yes. I just have to open it here because it's not in the slide. So the UNDFOM, okay, those were all corrected for ASH. Uh, the average was about 10% for this diet. And across all the diets we had, it varied from eight to 14, okay? And, you know, I know that there is a lot of discussion of UNDF as a predictor of intake, which I do think it does, okay? Uh, in our case, uh, the average UNDF intake as a percentage of body weight was 0.46, okay? Which is very close to what Rick Grant suggests as a threshold, okay? However, 
that's a number to consider for groups, right? Because those cows in our study vary from uh, 0 0.2 to 0 0.8. Okay, so there's a lot of variation within cows. And this is very likely related to body size and animal characteristics that change how they digest feeds. Okay, okay thank you. Thank uh, you. Brent, Brent added a comment that fresh cows with low dry matter intakes or cows with subclinical, subclinical ketosis tend to seek out places in the bunk where they can find or sort out finer particles. Um, is that something that you've maybe seen evidence of in your trials as well? I know Brent's experience is coming from commercial farms. So most of the trials I conduct is with mid lactation cows. However, if you go to literature, you will see that diets that promote greater intake uh, during early lactation actually really helps uh, with negative energy balance and consequently reduce the amount of ketotic cows. Right. So, for example, uh, some years ago, the Cornell group uh, ran a study where they feed early lactation cows with either conventional corn silage or BMR corn silage. If you are familiar with BMR, uh, BMR has less lignin and consequently is more digestible. So cows typically consume more feed because of that. Right. And that's exactly what they saw in that study. Right. They were able to see that those cows, because they were consuming a more digestible diet, uh, the greater intake help cows uh, to get more energy and consequently have less issues uh, with metabolic disorders. Very likely those cows, they are sorting and consuming finer particles because they are trying to get more energy to make sure they fulfill their needs. The issue associated with that for early lactation cows is if, you if those cows are consuming a lot of very digestible starch and don't have enough uh, um, effective fiber intake, and they just left the dry period where they had the last digestible diet, their rumen adaptation is another issue, right? So we may cause some issues with acidosis that further compromise some of those issues related to um, ketosis, right? So that's why I, in my opinion, right, and obviously we based on literature, uh, the early lactation cows, you have to be very careful in making sure you are providing enough energy, but also enough physically effective fiber, and we hope that those cows will not uh, sort enough, right, because we need to make sure they have both. Right? Thanks. Um, have you worked much with PEUNDF? Um, Jones posed this question. He feels that monitoring PEUNDF especially when you're trying to troubleshoot performance. Um, so looking at P, UNDF and rumen health and intake, um, he feels that's critical in Canada, I think based on how we feed haylage, alfalfa haylage and corn silage diets. Um, so we have a higher haylage inclusion that might be more typical in some of the US states. So do you have any comments around that? Yes, uh, first, no, I don't work a lot with PE, UNDF, but I've been studying that a lot. And I do agree with you. Uh, in my opinion, the PEUNDF is a much better metric than the UNDF. Okay. And the reason for that is you account for both fiber digestibility and particle size, right? Remember that we want more digestible diets, but we also want to make sure that particle characteristics allow cows to form a good rumen mat and consequently have good uh, rumen health, right? but we also want to avoid sorting. Uh, I think that the PUNDF is gonna be a good metric to help us formulate cows, uh, formulate diets for dairy cows. Uh, but I also think that together with that, there is a need to measure particle size uh, on farm and understand if sorting exists, right? I think a combination of multiple management or practice such as measuring sorting formulating diets based on particle size as well is key to do that. But I agree with you, PUNDF is very important. And going back to data from the Minor Institute, the prediction of intake and energy corrected milk is much more reliable with PUNDF than with UNDF alone. Thank you. So based on what you've learned about cow sorting behavior, do you have any management suggestions for producers who component feed? That's a very hard one. Uh, I don't have a lot of experience with component feed. 
Okay. Um, in my opinion, everything you do with TMRs have a chance to work with component feeds, but there is one thing that you can never replace, which is if you're providing way more forage at a certain time, obviously it's much easier for that cow to sort, right? Uh, the things that we see that work well uh, against sorting is making sure you have a good management in terms of routine, feeding cows every day at the same time, making sure the diets or the partial diets you're feeding are well mixed, right? Making sure you don't have very long particles that are easy to sort. Uh, other things that help with sorting is inclusion of liquid feeds. Okay, obviously you have to be careful with liquid feeds if you are component feeding because that cow already received a lot of very digestible carbohydrates very likely at a certain point, right? Um, some people add some water to the diet. From my perspective, adding water to the diet works only if you have dry diets. If you have wet diets, uh, especially if you use a lot of haylage, it, it doesn't work that well, right? And if you're partially feeding, very likely it's very wet because of more silage. So I don't think that's gonna help you. Uh, Push-ups help a lot to put some of the non-sorted feed on top of the sorted. So cows have access to that feed instead, instead of continuing to sort. But other than that, I don't have enough experience with component fat cows. Okay, well, thank you so much for those ideas. Um, hopefully they help some of our producers on the line who don't use a TMR to feed. Um, Oh, John's got more thoughts on uh, PEUNDF. <laughs> so he, he personally thinks it's uh, a fantastic metric that's not being used enough and that it may be more critical to evaluate particle length and UNDF in component fed diets than in TMRs um, to help figure out, you know, what, what are the cows eating consistently versus what are they sorting and leaving behind? Thanks for those thoughts, John. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, uh, I think uh, the more we measure, the more metrics you use, the better. And the only issue I see with the PEU and the F is that it's measured using a Rotap shaker, which requires a laboratory, right? I can do that. I have one. Uh, commercial labs can do that. Uh, I guess the question is, will we be able to adapt uh, that to some on-farm metrics? Uh, or is there a way we can measure that more often in commercial labs. I don't know the answer to any of those, but I do agree with you that it's a very important metric. Mm -hmm. So while you're, yeah, absolutely, this is a test that is developed and designed in a lab. Um, how do you feel about using the Penn State box to estimate that on farms, right? I think the Penn State box is great. You know, uh, I think we have to remember, however, that the Penn State box has more human error and that in order to have comparable numbers, you have to have the same person measuring the same way all the time, right? So, so you have to kind of uh, understand the issues of the system to better implement that. I do think it's, it works very well. Uh, I always suggest people to combine metrics of chemical characteristics of the diet or nutrient composition, digestibility, et cetera, with physical characteristics such as particle size. And I believe that the Penn State box is the most used particle size or the only one on farm, right? Uh, so, so I do think there are ways of using those. Uh, I don't think we have a specific metric done with the Penn State shaker box that resembles the PEUNDF, uh, but maybe that's the next step. I'm not sure, so. All right, well, thank you so much, Louise. I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat. So um, yeah, I guess with that, we'll hand it over to Terry to close out today's program. Thank you, Dr. Ferrado for sharing some of your expertise with us today. That was an excellent talk. Thanks again to our sponsors for their support of these webinars. I'd like to welcome everyone back tomorrow for the third and final installment of the webinars and look forward to seeing everyone tomorrow at 12 o'clock as well. Thank you and have a great day.